Hi, everyone. Okay, so in this video, I will be jumping into the new module two of Blue Book exam one, which was released, well, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so let's jump in, go over the questions, and see how to solve them with amazing techniques. Okay, so first, number one. Which expression is equivalent to 9x squared plus 7x squared plus 9x? Well, this one, I simply just need to add the common term. So in this case, they each have x squared in common. 9 plus 7 is 16. So 16x squared plus 9x, which matches correct option D. Continuing our journey. Of 900,000 beads, 828,000 are silver. What percentage of the beads are silver? Well, I can just put 828,000 over 900,000 and see um, percentagely what that equals. So 828 divided by 900 is equal to 0 0.92, aka 92%. Okay, so, so far they're starting easy. Okay, what is the value of 3t? So here, 6t minus 20 um, plus t is equal to 40 plus 4t. All right, so simplifying that, on this side you'd have 7t minus 4t, so it's just 3t. Move the 20 over, it's 60, and that's it. I can stop there. Don't take it further because um, you're asked for the value of 3t. The trap would be to, I suppose, give the value of t. Okay, moving on here. I have 5x plus 4 equals 4x plus 4 plus 29. And I'm asked for what is the value of x plus 4. Okay, so since these are, well, I have x plus 4 in front, Instead of distributing, solving, and making it a long process, um, we can do that. So let's do it. So I can subtract out the four. So let's do four, x plus four from each side. And here, minus four, x plus four. And in doing so, you'll actually just be left. Like, so this will be gone. So this just becomes, um, 1x plus 4 equals 29, which is the same as x plus 4 equals 29. So that's directly the answer. Okay, continuing. Oh, a neighborhood consists of a 2-hectare park and a 35-hectare residential area. The total number of, of trees in the neighborhood is 3,934. The equation 2x plus 35y equals 39 or 3,394 represents a situation. Which of the following is the best interpretation of x in this context? Okay, so here basically this would be referring to the two hectare trees. This would be, be referring to the 35 hectare trees and x would be however many number of hectares there are, and y would be however many 35 hectare trees there are. And since each of them is um, essentially, it's, uh, I would be increasing by a constant speed, so it would be aka the slope, um, I know that the x would be the average number of trees per hectare in the park. Okay. Okay. In um, on to number six. So for a certain rectangular region, the ratio of its length to width. Okay, so length to width, it's 35 to 10. If the width of the rectangular region increases by seven units, how must the length change to maintain, to maintain this ratio? 
Okay, so I could also express this. Remember, you can always express fractions as proportions, or sorry, ratios as fractions or proportions. So I could say the length to width is equal to 35 to 10 at the present moment. And then the width is increasing by seven units. So like the length of the new, which is what I'm trying to solve for with the width increasing by seven, I want it to maintain um, the same ratio proportion, which would be 35 to 10. And then by doing this, I can solve. So multi cross multiply. D, 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 D. So 35, well, W plus seven. So that would give me, I'll divide each side by 10. So 3.5 W plus seven, then I'm going to go ahead and distribute. So 3.5 W and 3.5 times seven um, is equal to oops, W plus 24.5. Okay, so from here, I can see that the length of the new would be 3.5 um, width, and the new length would be, well, plus the 24.5. So in order to maintain the same ratio, what's happening, I can see that it's actually simply just being increased by 24.5. Um, and so it must be choice B. However, like to go back and clarify, if I were to, our original ratio, it was L to W equals 35 to 10. And then I would have 10 L equals 3.35 W. So the original um, length was 3.5 W. And I can see that's what this is. So the length of the new is increasing by 24.5. Okay, amazing ratios. Continuing our journey. So P equals nine plus 14 over N. The given equation relates to numbers of P and N where N is not equal to zero and P is greater than nine. Which equation correctly expresses N in terms of P? Okay, so basically this is just um, the rearranging equations. So I can move um, P minus nine, you know, to the others, move the nine to the other side, that would give me 14 over N. And then if I just want to get N alone, I can multiply by the reciprocal, which would just be this multiplied by 14. And then I would also multiply this by one over 14. And so just you see, this cancels really nicely. Mm. And then over here, we would have um, P minus nine over 14 is equal to um, one over N. However, I don't want one over N, I want N over one. So final step, like I would just basically invert this. So, so I can see the answer must be D. However, just to show maybe a bit clearer, I can cross multiply and then I divide each side and I see that it's 14 minus P over N, which matches option choice D. Okay, amazing. So number eight, for the function F for each increase in the value of X by C, where C is a positive constant, the value of F of X increases by factor 27. Which of the following equivalent forms of the function F displays one over C as a coefficient of X? Okay, so basically what this means is that every time you change x by a particular amount, that the function is going to increase by a factor of 27 or be 27 times bigger. So the easiest way to approach these problems where they ask for, you know, displays that allows a coefficient of x is just simply plugging in numbers because it's a way to make these complicated problems easier. So let's take a look, for example, um, if I plug in zero for X for like all of the answer choices, example, if I go with A and I do F of zero is equal to 48 times three, one half times zero, um, 
that's going to just resolve. So like this becomes zero, then this would be zero. So it just becomes one, this whole expression. And the same would be true for, for all of them, essentially. So for example, in option B, if I do 48 times three to three cubed um, to the one to the six times zero, again, this becomes zero. And then zero gets distributed to the three. So it's three to the zero. So again, this whole expression just becomes one and is equal to 48. That's going to be true for all the answer choices. So I need to plug in a number, another number. Um, so the next thing I would do is be like, okay, so let's try to um, make it just one. So if I make x equal to two here, that would make my calculations, for example, just to go back to um, a, if I put in two, it'd be 48, three times one half times two, which gives me um, do, 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 48 times three. And then I can see that the function would be, you know, increasing by a factor of three. Okay, so that's not what I'm looking for. So let's go, for example, in B. If I make x equal to six, that will make this expression equal to one. So that would be 48, three cubed times, um, well, one over six times six, so one. And then this, I can see it's increasing by a factor of 27. In particular, it would be 48 times 27, which is equal to 1296. Um, so I would say that B is the answer. However, just to show like um, consistently why this works, I can also, for example, make X equal to 12. It's going to be quite a large number, but it would be, um, this becomes two, you know, so it becomes 48, three cubed, oops, sorry, three cubed multiplied by two. So this would be three to the sixth power. And essentially that will give me quite a large number. Um, it will give me 34,992. But if I want to compare um, like my function, so remember this was f of 6, this is f of 12. Let's see if it's um, increasing by factor 27. Oh, f of 12 divided by f of 6, that's equual to 34,992 over 1296. Lunas, guess what that reduces to? 27. So again, it's increased by 27 times. and it's showing that our option B is passing the, the test. Okay, so for these questions, basically what you want to do is always plug in zero for your starting point, because sometimes just plugging in zero is enough for some of the problems. But in this case, it gave us all the same. It took us back to um, f of x equaling 48. And then you want to increase x by the same amount and in this case, I kept increasing it by six in order to see if it remained a uh, consistent factor of growth of 27. And that's the only one that it does. Isn't it amazing? So continuing our journey, um, circle A in the x y plane has the equation x plus five squared plus y minus five squared equals four. Circle B has the same center as circle A. Okay, so just to break this down, this is referring to the circle equation x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to radius squared. Um, so I can see center of circle A, it's negative 5 and positive 5 are my hk, the center of the circle. And I also know that the radius is equal to 2 because, you know, 4 equals radius squared and um, 2 square root of four is two. Okay, so circle B has the same center as circle A. Okay. 
um, the equation defined in circle B, where k is constant, what is the value k? But it says it's two times the radius of circle A. So circle A has a radius of two. Therefore, the radius of circle B would be four. But then if I'm plugging this into the equation, I'm saying that this is actually equivalent to r squared. So it would be four squared and just 16 is the answer. So that's just interpretation of the circle equation. Okay, continuing. A business owner plans to purchase the same model of chair for each of the 81 employees. The total budget to spend on these chairs is 14,000, which includes a 7% sales tax. Which of the following is closest to the maximum possible price per chair before sales tax? Oh, that the business owner or the business owner can pay based on this budget. Okay, so well, let's make an equation. So x can be like the um, cost of chair before sales tax. So cost of chair pre sales tax. Okay, and then I know that the price for the chair after sales tax would just be well one point zero seven times x. cost after sales tax. And then the total cost for 81 chairs would be then, okay, so it would just be like 81 multiplied by the cost of the chairs, um, you know, pre prior to the sales tax, and then multiplied by 1.07 for the sales tax. And so this is all equal to 14,000. Okay, so basically, well, let's see what that calculates to. Mm -mm. Okay, so let's make this divide each side by 81. 14,000 divided by 81 is equal to like 100, oops, sorry, x, 172.839506 non terminating decimal, and then divide by the sales tax 1.07, and you get that it's around 5322. So the cost of the chair um, before sales tax would be 161.332, which is matching close to option B. Okay, and just why I did B 1.07, I'm doing like the concept of one plus K percent. Okay, amazing. Oh, system of equations. Um, da -da 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 -da. So we have two equations. The graph of the equations in the given systems intersect at one point. Um, what is the possible value of x? Um, so, I mean, we could solve this one. Like I could do that y is equal to negative 11 minus 8x and also put um, this one in terms of y, like y is equal to 2x squared minus 34, 1, and then set the two equations equal to each other, um, create a quadratic, well, do, 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 um, equals negative 11 minus 8x, and then set it equal, so it'd be like 2x squared plus 8x, um, my brains um oh, 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 minus 330 is equal to zero i could also divide everything by two so to simplify it so have x squared um plus 4x minus 165 is equal to zero and then well it's actually okay to solve i'll show both ways <laughs> Because now it's just become easy. Um, so we have one solution would be x minus 11 and x um, plus 15 is equal to zero. So I have one solution is x equals 11 and the other is x equals negative 15. So it is a, I mean, that was pretty simple to solve with, um, without doing too much work. However, just to show you can also solve that Desmos.
So you can see here that I've already graphed it, but I'm looking for the points of intersection. So I can see one is at negative 15, 109. Remember, negative 15 was your answer. There is another point, um, which is here. Well, it's not, it's not letting me go. And the other point, 11, negative 99. Okay, so we can see those. Um, that's why maybe this is a trap, but it's positive 11 would be the other solution for X, and therefore A. So you can either solve algebraically or plot in your decimals calculator, do what makes you happy. Okay, next, um, how many solutions does the equation have? So 150X minus 90 is equal to negative 90 plus 150x. Okay, here I could solve this out and get that zero is equal to zero, which essentially means that for every value, there's um, going to be infinitely many solutions. But the way that I see it, I think of a linear equation. And when we have a linear equation, it's always infinite solutions, aka the same line because they're constantly intersecting when the slope is the same. So same slope and same, I'll put in blue, and same y-intercept. That always means that they are the same line. Same line, they're constantly intersecting, and that's why, you know, there's infinitely many solutions. Okay, so, amazing. Um, continuing, oh, when the quadratic function, the vertex is at negative 3, 6, one of the x-intercepts of the graph is negative 17, 4, 0. What is the other x-intercept? Oh my goodness. Okay, so um, this is just amazing quadratic knowledge. Okay, so, uh, so here, negative 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, our vertex is here around negative 3, 6. Um, I'm also aware that the other x-intercept, it's negative 17 fourths. And by the way, negative 17 fourths is equal to negative 4.25. So we have four, we have five, it's around here, the negative 17 fourths. And it says it's an x-intercept, so it actually is opening downward. But anyways, the point is, when you know the vertex and you have the other x-intercept, they're always going to be symmetric or equidistant. So, for example, I can see um, the distance between 4.25 to 3. Here's a distance of 1.25. So, therefore, my other x-intercept must also have a distance of 1.25. So what I'm just going to do is take negative 3 and add 1.25 because I'm going to the right, so I'm adding. And that's just, um, so what I'm doing here, it's negative 3 plus 1.25. And that's equal to negative 1.75. So it's definitely negative, can't be C or D. And that's, so 1.75, well, it'd be around here. And you can see on my parabola, it's looking basically pretty equidistant, right? So you see the from the vertex to each x-intercept, they have a distance the same 1.25 um, units. And Therefore, the other x-intercept would be negative 7 fourths because negative 7 fourths equals 1.75, well, negative 1.75. So remember that with parabolas, super important x-intercepts, they are equidistant from the vertex. Okay, amazing. Oh my goodness, the graph of y equals f of x plus 14 is shown. Which equation defines function f? Okay, so if this is shown, 
so my my x intercept here it's uh or sorry my y intercept is at zero two okay so that's what's shown and if it's this just means that the original function has been shifted upwards 14 units so if i subtract 14 this means that the original y-intercept of f of x um, is at 0, negative 12. But, sorry. Um, so two, negative 11 and negative 12. And looking at the options, there's only one answer that has a uh, y intercept of negative 12, so therefore it must be that one. Okay, classic translations. Um, moving on. Oh my goodness, another discriminant. We have one in module one, now there's one in module two. In the given equation, for which of the following values will be, will the equation have more than one real solution? So more than one real solution is when b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero. Okay, and basically all I have to do is plug in my values, B is B, the 64 is my A value, and 25 is C, and say it's greater than zero. Alrighty, so solving that is B squared um, minus 6,400 is greater than zero. B squared is greater than 6,400. Final step, I'm going to take the square root. Important, when you take this, the square root um, with an inequality, there'll be two solutions, both the positive case, oops, hold please. Um, so there's one case where B is greater than 80 or the negative value, which should, so what you do with inequalities, I would take the sign, invert it, and set it to its negative value, okay? Because negative 80 squared, right, is also greater than 6,400. Okay, so, um, well, actually it'd have to be like negative 81 squared. <laughs> but anyways, um, looking at this, the only option that there is being, there's nothing for greater, so no, no, this is a trap. It's got to be then less than negative 80, which is a, oh my goodness, wasn't that amazing? Okay, continuing our journey. Um, okay. Okay, so these, I've seen them come up on official exams. For each real number r, which is the following point size on the graph of each equation in the expert plane for the given system. Okay, so first thing to notice is that these two equations it's, they're the same. If I multiply everything here by five, I get that it is 10x plus 15y plus 35. So I really only need to test the coordinates in one of the equations since it's the same align, so they'll have the same solutions. Okay, and I'm asked which of the long points lies on each of the graphs. So all I would do, like for example, take the smaller reduced equation, 2x plus 3 equals 7, and just substitute this in and see if it's actually true. So I put this in for x and this in for y. So 2, um, r over 5 plus 7 um, plus 3, negative r over 5 plus 35. Is it true that that's equal to 7? This would give me 2 fifths r plus 14. Um, minus three fifths r um, plus 35 times three equals seven. Okay, um, that's not going to simplify much more. Like I could get that this is like negative one fifth plus one nine or r one nineteen equals seven. I could maybe get a solution for R, but that's not what I'm solving for. So I want it to be proven that like set whatever, when I plug this in, seven equals seven. So A doesn't work. Let's try option B. So B, same thing, two X plus three Y equals seven. 
Um, here my x is do 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 do, and my y will be just r. Okay, so here two negative three r halves plus seven halves plus three r equals seven. So here I can see when I distribute here to here, the two will cancel and cancel. So this is just negative three r plus seven plus three r equals seven. And I can see nicely these cancel and I get that seven equals seven. This one checks, I can stop there. We have found our winner, option B. Okay, um, I noticed that for these ones, I've seen them come up relatively frequently. I'm usually looking for whatever coefficient I have in front. Like in this case, I had two, I had two, right? Then I look for a fraction with two so that it cancels nicely. Um, but yes, I find for this one, substitution is a nice way to go. And it was pretty quick, right? Okay, pressing on, oh my goodness, classic. In the given system of equations, t is constant. If the system has no solution, so remember if a system of equations, linear has no solutions, that means they are parallel lines. And parallel lines um, have the same slope. Okay, so um, first thing to do is take original equation and always rearrange in terms of y. So this would be like negative 16y is equal to negative 4x plus 2, divide everything by negative 16. So you get 4 sixteenths x um, minus 2 sixteenths. Likewise, for the other equation, we have ty equals 1 half plus 2x, divide everything by t. So we get y is equal to um, one half t um, plus two x over t. Important, I'm looking, parallel lines have the same slope. So final step, set the slopes equal to each other, four sixteenths and two over t. And careful, cause like here they inverted the y-intercept and slope to try to trick you. So final step, um, well, I'll just cross multiply. the way. 4 16 equals to 2 over t. And then I have that 4t is equal to 32. And t is equal to my answer, which is 8. OK, these ones are super common. They're on many exams. So make sure you follow what I did. OK, in an isosceles right triangle, isosceles right triangle is always the 45, 45, 90. Um, it has a hypotenuse length of 15 inches. Okay. What is the perimeter of this triangle? Okay. So this is also given to you on the formula sheet, but the proportions of a um, 45, 45, 90 triangle are x, x, and hypotenuse is x root 2. So I can say that 58 is equal to x root 2. And then I can divide each side by the square root of 2. And then I don't want square root of two in the denominator, so I'll rationalize it out. You rationalize by multiplying the top and bottom by root two. So that gives me 58 root two divided by two. And um, that's 29 root two equals x. So that means each side here is 29 root two, and this is 29 root two. And final perimeter would just be, well, 29 root two plus 29 root 2 plus 58, which is correct option um, choice C. Wasn't that amazing? Alternatively, if I find a lot of students don't like to memorize the 45, 45, 90 relationship of x, 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 x root 2, you can also alternatively do Pythagorean theorem because it'd be x squared plus x squared is equal to um, 58 squared, and then you do 2x squared equals 58 um, squared. And then you would, you know, solve it out. Let's see if I get the same. 
I think I will. So you would get 2x squared is equal to 3364. Divide each side by 2. x squared is equal to 1682. And if you take the square root of that, it is, yeah, approximately 29 or 2. Um, so that's an alternative way, but I prefer the way I did it first. <laughs> okay, moving on. Mm. So for the linear function, the table shows three values of x and their corresponding values. Okay. Um, it's linear. So first I can I can use my slope formula. So I can choose any coordinate. I'm just going to go with the first two, negative 64 minus 0 over 1 minus 2. And that gives me negative 64 over negative 1 equals 64 equals m. Okay, so I know like y equals 64x plus b. And then if I want to find what b is, I take any coordinate. I'm going to go with the easy one, 2, 0. Substitute it, so 0 equals 64 um, times 2 plus b. E. And that will give me that. Um, so negative 128 is equal to b. So my final equation would be y equals 64x minus 128. And I'm asked for, remember this was all like f of x equals ax plus b. So a equals 64, b equals negative 128. And then a minus b would be substitute in. And then you have to be very careful with the sign distribution, 64 minus negative 128. So it actually becomes positive and would be 192, the correct answer. Wasn't that amazing? Um, oh, continuing our journey. So data set A consists of 10 positive integers, less than 60. The list gives nine of the integers from data set A. Um, okay. The mean of those nine integers is 42. Mm -hmm. If the mean of data set A is an integer that is greater than 42, what is the largest integer from set A? Okay, so, well, first I could find the average. Mm -hmm. So here's my nine integers, and then I have like my 10th, well, okay, hold on. Um, so this divided by nine is equal to 42. Okay, so if I add x to that, divide by 10, it says that the mean of the integer is greater than 42. Okay, so, Adding those together, I get that 378 plus x over 10 is greater than 42. Okay, and then, okay, it, if I resolve that out, this would just be like 378 plus x is greater than 42. So x, sorry, 420, and then x is greater than 42. Okay, and it tells me that because it's a ton, less than 60. Okay, so I know that it falls in the range, like it's got to be bigger than 42, this value, but it's also going to be less than 60. And it says that um, the mean of the data set A is an integer. That's super important. It's an integer. Okay, so remember, Going back to here, um, in order for this to be an integer, it has to be divisible by 10. And so, for example, if I do 378 plus 43, that's not divisible by 10. The, so I want a number when I add it, it's going to be divisible by 10. The only integer that works, so 
example, 378 plus 43 divided by 10, that's 420, you know, that's 421. Um, well, it's 42.2. not an integer. Likewise, since I am asked for the largest integer, so some, a trap also could be, be like, oh, okay, it's got to be 59. Well, let's see. 378 plus 59 divided by 10, that's equal to 43.7. You know, so like not an integer. So the only one that will give me divisible by two, it's 52. And just to show, it'd be 378 um, plus 52 divided by 10. Well, we notice it's 430 divided by 10, which equals 43, and integer. And that's why the answer will be 52. Okay. Amazing, right? Okay, continuing. Um, for groups of 25 or more people, a museum charges 21 per person for the first 25 people. Okay, so it charges $525 for the first 25 people and then 14 for each additional person. Okay, um, so I know that each additional person it's cost $14, right? Um, however, I have to subtract. So normally it would be 14 times N. This is definitely a trap. But I have to take out those first 25 people. So it'd be 14 N minus 25, and then plus our original cost of those 25 original people. And that gives me... 14n um, minus 350 plus 525, and that's equal to 14n plus 175. So this is the correct expression, option A, that takes it, that takes off the cost of those first 25 people, which um, you need to take into consideration. Isn't it amazing? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to find a one in triangle LM, LMN and RST, angles L and R each have a measure of 60 degrees. All right, so let me draw this out. Okay, so I have LMN, RST, and Angles L and R are each 60 degrees. And I know that LN equals 10, RT equals 30. Which additional piece of information is sufficient to prove that the triangle element is similar to RST? Okay, so MN equals 7. Okay, and ST equals 7. Well, right now, I've just... Oh, it's not writing. Okay, there. Um, it's I see that they're no longer proportional to each other, the triangles. And since either for similar triangles, I have to know that all the angles are equal to each other or that the sides are all congruent to each other because if they have, if they have proportional sides, if, if the sides are in the same proportion, then they can also determine the relationship of the angles. However, this one doesn't work because it's ruining the um, like proportionality of the triangles. So therefore, not A. So if MN is seven and ST is 21, would that be enough? So for B, we can see that um, there is, like they're each increased by a factor of three. So that makes sense. However, in order for me to prove similarity, I would have to know this angle because the side angle side theorem 
um, basically consists that there's two pairs of corresponding sides. So basically two sides are in proportion, which that checks, but the angle included between these pairs of sides is equal in both triangles. So since I don't know this angle, angle N or T, and if it's equal to each other, I can't know that they're similar. So not B. Looking at C, the measures of angles M and S are 70. So M is 70 and S is 60 respectively. Well, this creates a problem because then this would be 50. And then this has to be 60 in order for it to sum to 180 degrees. So that doesn't prove similarity. And finally, it must be option D. The measures of angles M and T, so M is 70 and T, wait, M is 70, okay, and the T is 50 respectively. So that's fine, which just means that then this one must be 70 and this must be 50. And since they have the same angles, now the sum of the angles are all the same, now I can prove that it is they are similar. So this is true because it's basically using um, the angle-angle um, similarity criterion, which just requires that two pairs of corresponding angles um, need to be congruent in order for the triangles to be similar. And um, that's that's okay and amazing because I can see then, right? Like this correlates to this, this correlates to this, and this will correlate to this side, this correlates to this side, and vice versa. So it's option D that proves that they are similar. Okay, amazing. So that completes um, Blue Book Exam 2, Module 2, with all the new questions implemented that College Board updated in August 2024. And yeah, I hope this information was helpful and useful. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.